Welcome to today's Global Connections program. I'm Bill Miller. Today we're going to take a look at some local programs that could be utilized possibly at the regional, national, international levels to deal with problems such as climate change, the sixth extinction that so many people are talking about that's actually underway right now that could obliterate a large part of the living organisms on the planet, and income and political inequalities. I guess today is going to give us some unique ideas on how to deal with these three issues. My guest today is Tom Blattner. Tom Blattner is the founder and president of Janus Solutions and the co-founder and president of the Family Success Institute. Tom, welcome to today's Global Connections program. Nice to be here, Bill. I appreciate you being with me. Let's start off with just get a brief overview of each. The Janus Solutions, what is, what is that about? Janus Solutions is a um, consulting firm that I founded and that we work with uh, local communities, nonprofits, and government agencies to try to identify the most intractable problems that they're facing and come up with future-looking solutions that they can affect. Okay. Uh, the, the Family yes, Success please. Institute um, grew out of our work on the ground, and we found that this approach to engaging families and communities and helping to find solutions to their futures um, was showing so much promise that uh, I and uh, co-founder Gene Warnock, who's one of my wonderful colleagues, set up a nonprofit organization to look at research and policy that would actually begin to bring some of these family success ideas to a much larger level. Mm -hmm. And our viewers can go to your website at Family Success Institute. Family, sec family Success Institute.com is, com is where we, you can learn com. about okay, that. Okay, that's yep. great, very good. Well, let's talk about some of those programs and how you help people achieve their their maturation and uh, to lead a better life, to have a better life and, and create a better life for them. Yeah. What, are, what are some of the ideas that you have in that area? Well, one of the, one of the things, I, I worked in government in mm -hmm. these all these different issues that families face for a number of years. And over a period of 60 years, we've invested billions of dollars in trying to respond to the symptoms of family distress um, after they occur. And so those symptoms could be anything from unemployment to mm -hmm. health issues to addiction to the full range of human distress. And however, we don't ask the question, what are the basic things that people need in the first place in order to do well? And the whole industry is organized around responding after the fact. So what we have done is to go into a variety of local communities, starting in Newark, New Jersey, with um, Cory Booker when he was the mayor there. He became very interested in thinking about the future of kids in his city. And we, so we structured these programs to engage the full range of the community, not in how do we f identify all these horrible problems and mm -hmm. try to throw money and, and Band-Aids at them, but what are the conditions that they would like to see in place to help them have a good life. Mm -hmm. So an example might be um, arranging a, uh, when, when an uh, individual comes out of incarceration, they face a myriad of legal problems, they don't have a job, they're not connected to their family. So we set up in Newark and Camden, New Jersey, we helped establish a family success, or a uh, father success center. In um, Newark, the has the highest number of grand parents raising kids in the country. We set up a Grand Family Success Center, and they're all organized around supporting people with their, the basic needs that they have to do well, as opposed to treat the symptoms of their distress. Mm -hmm. Now, before the program started, we were talking about one issue you're working with, and you're bringing to the attention of the New Jersey General Assembly, and that's the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Yes. And of course, that was a 1989 treaty at the United Nations, a very important one, and as I recall, every country in the world has pretty much signed on signed on to it, except the United States. That we have not done that. That's what correct. are you doing with that particular treaty? Well, what we, what we um, in, when we did this local work in Camden County, New Jersey, and the city of Newark, when Mayor Booker was there, is that we borrowed from the International Bill of Rights for Children, the, mm -hmm. the, a, and those jurisdictions established bills of rights for children and families that, that included things like safety and the right to education and health care and all these different things. And one of the most interesting things um, about the Bill of Rights in Camden is we asked a, a, a group of young folks mm -hmm. what did they think was the most important right to for their future. They said if we don't have clean air and if we don't have clean water and if we, we don't have clean earth, 
we don't have to worry about the rest of these things because we're not going to be here. It's a mood issue. It's a mood issue. So, so the basic conditions that we've identified through highfalutin research with a wonderful mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Cindy Levy is my friend and colleague who developed our research, but also more, I think, as important, talking to hundreds of parents and kids. What are the basic conditions that anybody needs to have a good chance at a good life? Strong family relationships, community connections. Safety defined broadly, environmental, virtual, mm -hmm. physical, et cetera. Uh, financial security, health and well-being, and lifelong learning and education. And one of the things that I have learned in my travels around the world and talking to hundreds of people, I don't care if you're rich or poor, I don't care where you live, I don't care what your composition is, that these are universal conditions that any family needs to have in place in order to raise their kids to have a good life. Mm -hmm. Before we get back into that, I might mention too that that uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child is still languishing in the United States Senate along with many other UN treaties, one, well, two that come to mind are CEDAW, Convention for the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. This is a no-brainer, everybody's in agreement with it, but it's still not moving. It's been there since the late 70s, as I recall. Yeah, yeah. The other is the Convention on the Law of the Sea Treaty. The U.S. military is in favor of it, business interests are in favor of it, and yet you find one or two senators who have blocked it these low these many years, and this is going to put the United States, in my opinion, in the opinion of people who actually know something about this, it really in a very precarious situation as they move forward to exploring the oceans and that type of thing. But anyway, I digress. Well, I, well, Please, first, go right well first of all, I completely agree with you, and it is an embarrassment the United States has not ratified the International Bill of Rights mm -hmm. for Kids, and so we have, uh, through our Family Success Institute, we've gathered folks from communities all over the state to develop a platform and our first platform is that New Jersey be the first state in the United States to establish a Bill of Rights for Children and Families for mm -hmm. every person in the state of New Jersey and we, we are pushing that to be a breakthrough and maybe that will embarrass the federal government the people who were working in that <laughs> august uh, <laughs> body of the Senate That's to right. uh, you <laughs> know, great get off their body. butts and do what they should do. <laughs> <laughs> great deliberative body, very true. Well, let's go back. Now, uh, what you're doing at the state level, the local level, how can that be elevated or moved into the international, mar uh, international arena so that we could draw upon your models, upon some of the suggestions you have, some of the programs, the, the way, the techniques that you've developed to deal with the sixth extinction, and I'll ask you in a minute what the sixth extinction is, climate change and income inequality. And that's not just income inequality, but it uh, deals with other areas, political inequality and just on, on across the board. But those are three major areas that we're dealing with right now. Of course, climate change and the sixth extinction tie right into each other. But h how could th that uh, your information be moved to the international arena? Well, one, one of the things that I think that, and, and obviously um, with all three of those arrows, areas, the speed of change is at warp speed. And we have traditionally looked for people on high to begin to solve problems, and that's not going to happen in the future. So our, our approach is that we have to um, work with communities to deal with the issues that are in front of them, and that community by community, communities linking with other communities, lo communities linking with people in other countries, that we can create a movement that will begin to, th to deal with these three issues. And there's nothing, you know, this whole issue of climate crisis, I mean, people, I think change is a, it's a, it's, we are, we are in a meltdown, we're in a current crisis. Mm -hmm. And the way that we look at this, it's not only climate change and cli climate crisis, but it's linked to our de devastation of the natural environment and the natural world. and it's done by us. This is not some outside force. I was thinking of that, that um, movie in pop culture, Independence Day, where there were aliens who were gonna come in and destroy the world, and people from all these different countries had to get together to sort of deal with mm -hmm. them. This is a little different because these conditions are caused by, we have met the enemy and it's us. And there have been, according to the scientists, according to the anthropologists, the people who have studied this, there have been five extinctions of life, or not all life, but large part of life on Earth. The fifth one was because a meteorite fell into the Gulf of Mexico, and basically the dinosaurs and all the 
or most living organisms died <laughs> at that point because of air pollution and a variety of things. And there were also volcanoes that were erupted, erupting that were caused by that. Now we're into what they call the sixth extinction. And as you mentioned, this is uh, human-made, I should say. And the, we've had warnings of this for years. Uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, a UN body, was back in the 80s, early 90s, warning that this was happening. They've, they've had five major reports. The most recent one that came out indicated that we have 12 years, if that, to try to get a handle on what you said. Uh, this, the climate crisis is moving at warp speed. It's, it's almost like it's on steroids. The, the glaciers are melting, desertification is taking place. You see the bleaching of the, the reefs around the world. The weather patterns are changing. And this is a major problem. What can we do <laughs> to deal with that? Yeah, this is a rather <laughs> large uh, challenge. It's a, it's but a big but challenge. In, but but yeah. just, just to make it even more challenging, mm -hmm. that in terms of the destruction of the natural world, which is purely uh, humankind doing this, um, the, the, I was reading just recently that there are 150 plant and animal species that are disappearing every day. So this is not something that's in the future. This is at we, as, as we're sitting here. And I think particularly from our lens, which is mm -hmm. families raising kids, uh, probably the scariest thing it, to, for parents to think about in the future with their kids is what we're talking about. So we have to find ways to allow people to understand the reality of the situation that is in the present. We have to find ways to break through denial, but do it in a way that we can support people to come together to think about it together, because it is scary as all get out. And then I think the third part of this is that we have to find ways that people who don't think that they have common interests to realize that survival is a common interest. And if we all can come together and form different kinds of relationships and different kinds of solution solutions, in the future, we can make a difference, but I think as importantly, in the moment, we can make a difference. Mm -hmm. Well, you're watching Global Connections Television, which is a privately funded, independently produced program. The opinions expressed on Global Connections are solely those of the moderator and his guest. We would invite our viewers to go to our website at www.globalconnectionstelevision.com to view previous programs. Also, if you're involved with a PBS or Community Access Television Station, or perhaps an educational institution that has an intra-campus television hookup, or you just have a website, you like our shows and you want to share them, please feel free to do so. Global Connections Television is provided as a public service to help us better understand international issues and how they impact our lives. Today we're talking about three major areas that are inter interconnected to a large degree, and that's climate change, the sixth extinction, and also income inequality. My guest is an expert on a variety of programs that may be of assistance in helping us deal with these issues. Tom Blattner is the founder and president of Janus Solutions and co-founder and president of the Family Success Institute. Tom, we're talking about this situation with climate change, the sixth extinction, and it, it just seems that, well, you mentioned about the 150 species that we're losing every day. It seems like the news gets more bleak as every time we pick up the newspaper, we see that the Arctic ice is melting. They're, they're predicting now that within 20 to 30 years, there will be no Arctic ice. By 2050, there will be no ice on the planet. That does not bode well. Uh, we could go through a whole panoply of other issues. It, with the, the, here, we, as we look around the world, we see that there are people, there are governments who are moving towards trying to deal with this. In the United States, we don't have that. We have a government that's pushing fossil fuels, which is a large part of the problem, leaving that carbon footprint. Uh, are the mechanisms that are in place today, the, not only overseas, but also in the United States, is, is the leadership, uh, really, are they qualified? Can they actually deal with these problems? Or do we need to reshape or rethink how we deal or be more adaptive in dealing with these problems? No, I, I think we have to, we have to have a complete um, overhaul of the way we're thinking about dealing with these issues. And I think it starts with um, finding safe ways to, for people to talk about values. What are we all about? So is, I don't, is anybody gonna say, well, our value is that we wanna see the extinction of every life form on the, on the planet? No, but right now it's become so scary for people who don't know one another and think that they have differences to get in the same space and talk in a safe way about these issues. So we have to find leaders who have the skill and the will and the, the knowledge to bring people together in a completely different way. 
uh, and people who have all different kinds of views and interests. Secondly, the old concepts of strategic planning and sort of linear thinking and all these, mm -hmm. by, by the time most strategic plans are done now, the rate of change is so fast that they're obsolete before they're done. So we have to find different ways of thinking about planning. Cer certainly for certain projects, we need tactical planning, but we need intuitive ways of dealing with issues. We need to design, build things as they're happening. Mm -hmm. We have to get people together who don't normally get together with different skill sets. So it's a much more intuitive, organic way of providing leadership. And the, it, but, and I, but I think the, the key to our experience is it, it's, it has to come from the people who are affected by all these difficulties and find, finding ways to bring people together in safe ways to come up with very concrete solutions. Mm -hmm. And I think going back to values is to give people a sense that there is some hope that we can make positive progress because everything we hear is negative. And mm -hmm. if everything is negative, we're not gonna go to the positive. Mm -hmm. That's for sure, that's uh, definitely, <laughs> you've got it right there. Yeah, and we have to look, do we not have to look at our economic system too? Because the economic system, the market system around the world thrives or is driven to a large part on expansion. And one of the problems, according to the scientists, is that we, first of all, we're overpopulated. We have too many people. And they're talking, the, UN, the UN's latest projection is by 2050, yeah, 2050, there'll be about 9.5 billion people. We're at 7.7 .7 right now. That will be another 2 billion people consuming resources, buying products, cars, what have you. That, it's, it's, a, it's almost a never-ending cycle. The more you expand, the worse the situation gets. And we're polluting the planet even more and uh, there's no guarantee we're ever gonna make 2050 at the rate we're going as, as we talk about this sixth extinction. But we're gonna have to review the whole economic system. Ab not? Absolutely. And I, and I think that, because you mentioned about these inequalities and disparities, mm -hmm. and they're basically disparities in power, whether it's economic or cultural or social or by particular groups, that, you know, and, and that the dynamic is that fewer people have power and more people have less power. And if you think about the implications of that as climate crisis mm -hmm. becomes closer to us, then you're gonna have the people who have the least resources and the least power suffer the most. But the irony of this is that the people who have all the power and all have all the money somehow think that they can mm -hmm. escape this phenomenon. And according to the definition of extinction, there aren't survivors. So we have to find a way for us all to realize that we're in this together. We have to have we have to combine our sense of capitalism with social responsibility. And it's not a up here kind of thing. It's mm -hmm. you know basic survival. If we don't find different ways to come together and get into these processes together, we're not going to be here. Mm -hmm. We're gonna to have to move from a more individualistic type of society to more of a communalistic. And we're not talking about socialism or communism no, or anything no. like that. It's dealing with these problems and seeing if there are other ways that we can deal, confront these issues without disrupting people's lives too dramatically. But again, it is, it, uh, it's, it's just uh, really frightening when we look at all the studies that are coming out and we see. And you were, uh, another problem too is we have this deniability. We have denial claims being made in the United States and some from people around the world. And of course, one of the challenges is too that uh, a lot of this, these so-called studies that are put out by people who say that climate change is not happening, climate crisis is not happening, is they're being funded by the fossil fuel companies, right. the coal companies, the oil companies, the gas companies, and they're a major part of the problem. But we've got to reorient folks and to explain to them that it is happening. Well, this issue of denial is a really important issue. And uh, one of the things that we've talked about with local communities and people who, who are you know, struggling in their families, that, that they're always telling to me that we have to plan for the worst and hope for the best. Mm -hmm. And I think so in, in this whole issue of climate denial and all these kinds of things are going on, let's assume that it is happening. Wouldn't we be smart to, try to do something about it as opposed to keep our heads in the sand. And that's why this whole issue of finding safe ways to break through the denial and what this means for parents raising their kids, for people who are living in different places around the world, we're all in this together and we have to find a way 
to communicate better and act mm -hmm. together. And I honestly believe that this is only gonna happen family by family, community by community, communities linking with other communities and building a movement because it's not gonna happen from the top down, particularly as in, in the context of where power lies, as you described, in terms of the interests that are, are not common. Mm -hmm. And the population has a large part to deal with this, and to, well, they're contributing to the problem. And again, as, as folks have said, well, it's not really the number of people, it's what we consume. And that's a large part of it. But most people in our capitalist society, they want to consume more, and everybody wants a nicer house, want a bigger car, they want more air conditioning, that type of thing, which is natural. Uh, we could certainly understand that, but the planet cannot sustain it. And we're like the frog, the, the proverbial frog in the boiling water. The planet is heating up, and the climate crisis is underway, and we don't feel it as much until you really turn up the heat, and it's too late to get out of the pot. And we're into it right now. Prince Harry, the other day, and his wife Megan, may be the poster children, I guess, for reducing the population. They said they're having two children, and that's it. And of course, the replacement rate's 2.1 children, just to maintain your population at 7.7 .7 billion. So it, it could be if we could if there were a zero population growth program that could take place around the world, we could actually see a reduction in the population, which would help. It's not going to resolve Absolutely. the problem. It, it certainly will not. But we do need, well, let's say people consuming less. Yes. And fewer people will consume less. <laughs> populating the world. <laughs> That's right. And then, and of course, I think the other thing that, that from, from my perspective with this is that the, as these changes become more apparent to us, the people who are going to suffer the most from them, from them, are the people with the least resources and the re least power. Mm -hmm. So we need to we need to take this on together. Mm -hmm. We certainly do. We've got to rethink the way we're doing it, and it's going to be disruptive. It's going to be even more disruptive ten or fifteen years from now than it is today if we don't deal with it. But it, it I think you, I, I like your comment, the climate crisis instead of climate change, because it, it has gone far beyond that. And even some of the scientists, the so-called pseudoscientists, who were paid by the fossil fuel companies years ago were saying climate change isn't happening. They're saying it is happening today, but don't worry about it, it's cyclical. Well, that's true. One of the last extinctions, there was climate change, and it wiped out a large part of the world. So if it's cyclical, we're heading right down the same path that we went down Absolutely. 400 million years ago. I'm just pulling that figure out of yeah. my ear. Yeah. But uh, many, many, many millions of yeah. years ago. Well, in the last, please, go right ahead. Well, I, I was going to say that one of the, one in, in addition to denial, we have this um, inability to look at the future. What's, mm -hmm. you know, what are things going to be like in the future? And one of the reasons that we, in our family success thinking, is to think about kids are born and what are their lives are going to be like and what are their kids' lives are going to be like. And our uh, colleague Rick Smyre, who was the mm -hmm. founder of the Communities of the Future, um, talks about the idea of faint signals can tell us when they become really loud signals. And I'm of a generation that... Uh, used to listen a little bit to Bob Dylan, and one of the things he said is you don't need a weatherman to know which way the wind blows. And we are blowing in a really scary direction. It certainly is, and just today, the Secretary General of the United Nations, Antonio Guterres, had a press conference that really drove home the importance of dealing with this climate crisis and to move quickly and not sit around debating and say, we need more studies. Well, he didn't say this, I'm saying this. We need more studies. No, we don't. We have more studies. And even if you never read a single scientific study, just look at what's going on around you. Just look at what's happening in your own neighborhood and how your, your life has changed because of climatic changes and crises that are taking place. But Tom Blattner, this is a very important topic, and we just barely scratched the surface on it. Hopefully we can get back together at a later point in time and delve into to, to it in greater detail. And the next time we get together, maybe we'll see that the governments are actually doing something, the private sector, and there, there are many people doing something. I don't want to mention, say that they're yeah. not, but we've got to move, we have to move at warp speed or we're going to lose the battle. But I, I want to thank you so very much thank for you, a Bill, very for interesting and very informative Great. program. Great. Thanks. Thanks. I'm Bill Miller. Thank you for joining us today on Global Connections Television.